Let's jump into it. The series that we began, it's called The Book of Life. And the word life here is an acronym. It's to take 774,000 words and give you four to help you as a simple way to understand the Bible. Because the story of the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus, but truly it's all of our story. And so it begins this way. L represents likeness. It's the story of our true identity. Because why? Our identity came from God. And it's so much more than what we understand right now. But until you recognize that you came from God and belong to God, you'll never really know who you were created to be like. But what happened? The second aspect of it, I represents isolation. Something came between us and God. Have you ever felt separated? Have you ever felt isolated from God? Well, this is the story of isolation. It's the story of our separation, which represents the Old, text, Old Testament text, which can be confusing, can be difficult for people, because in that period, isolation represents the time between God's former presence and his future promise. And it's in that moment that God continued to show his faithfulness to humankind until he could bring that fulfillment. Because if you've ever been separated, or if you even feel that way now, I have good news because today's message represents this next one, which is this F, fellowship, which is the story of a present God. Jesus is the God who came to be with us. And then the last, le the last uh, letter, E, represents ever-present, which is the story of a people inhabited by God, which is what we're going to cover next week. But today, again, it's the story... Fellowship is the story of a present God. It's the story of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Have you ever really ever wanted to be with somebody so much that you just, you wanted to spend time, you wanted to, to hang out, you wanted to share life together? The word fellowship that I used, I took from the, the Greek word koinonia, which is so relevant to Christianity. It really has its origins in the Christian message. Because the word koinonia represents community, but it represents relationships of sharing life together, to, to freely sharing equally into all things. It's, it's relationships of love and intimacy. It's relationships of giving and receiving. It's a relationship that I believe all of us desperately long for, but it really is a relationship that the Trinity shared together in eternity. And when mankind was created, God created humankind to share relationship with him and one another. I remember when I first met Kath, I so wanted to be with her because she fascinated me. She excited me. She was just amazing. I love spending time talking to her. We just connected so well. And so at the time when we began our relationship, we were an hour and a half apart. And so as disciplined as I tried to be with my time, and leave her house at an appropriate time to get home readily. The crazy part, we'd leave the house, go out to the car, and talk another hour by the car before I'd actually leave. In fact, I remember one of the most exciting dates we had. I surprised her, and we went to Six Flags because Kathy and I are truly amusement park people. We love to ride the rides. We just, thrill rides are our thing. We love it. And so that evening, we closed out the park. So at midnight, they kicked us out of Six Flags, New Jersey. We walk out to the car, and this is just how crazy it is when you want to be with somebody. We end up sitting and talking in an empty parking lot with each other for another hour until we realize, oh my goodness, we have a three-hour ride home. We could have been talking in the car the whole ride home. So yes, leaving Jersey at 1 a.m. in the morning, I drop her off at 4 and then have an hour and a half ride home. Guess what? Not a lot of sleep during the time when we were dating because you so wanted to be with them. But you know this. The facts are, when you're able to do so, when we married and we were able to establish the fellowship of being together continually, not being apart, you realize it changes the dynamic of the relationship. It requires more of us because those adjustments are truly what love requires of us, but it's something that we get able to give and receive. I remember asking my best friend one time, because he got married before I did, and I said to him, what's marriage like? Dude, tell me, you're, you're married now. I'll never forget this, because this is the definition he gave me. He said, Ken, marriage is like going over your best friend's house and not 
having to go home. The fact is, the story of Jesus is the story of God with us. What, what extent, what, what willingness God went through to be a part of us, to, to come to be with us and to restore the opportunity for fellowship with all of us in humanity. Jesus became human so that we could relate to him, so that we could know him personally and intimately. And so in essence, Look at this. In Matthew 1, Matthew said it this way. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet. The virgin, look, the virgin will conceive a child. And she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That's the story of Jesus. So here's the big idea today. Jesus came to show us who God is. In other words, Jesus showed us that God became human so that we could know him, that we could relate to him, so that we wouldn't be intimidated or put off by him because Jesus, as a human being, was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he never sinned. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was abandoned. Jesus experienced the things that we go through in life, and he did so as God as in, in a human body. To help us know and understand and see who God was in total clarity. It was a God who was willing to be with us. So Jesus came to show us who God is and what life in fellowship with God looks like. So in essence, Jesus came in this respect. He came and showed us how willing God was to be with us. All that he was willing to go through, all that he was willing to do to restore the opportunity a fellowship with human being. Because the message of Christianity rests on the hope of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the cornerstone of all that we believe. And you see, too often we romanticize this idea of Jesus in his birth and what we know in the story of Christmas. But when you look at the story beyond all the pageantry and all the celebratory aspects of us after the fact, the story was gritty. The story was, was, was gut-wrenching. The story was raw. Because here, God came to a virgin girl and told her she would have a son. But to the community that she lived in, it looked like she was unfaithful to the one she was betrothed to be married to. Even her own fiancé questioned and wondered until God affirmed to him that what was in her womb was truly the Son of God. But now they had to be of the shame and all of the, 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 the raw, gritty, gutty aspects of it. In fact, where Jesus was actually born at, I can't even fathom a human being being born into those conditions. A stable, a place where animals rested and, and all the other things animals do. You see, I've been to third world nations and still never encountered poverty at a level that someone was born in conditions like that. But what did all of that point to? The willingness that God was ready to come down on our level in such a humble and unpretentious way. So make it possible that no matter who we are in any sphere of human, humankind, that he was approachable, that we could know him. He made himself vulnerable by being willing to be a baby in the womb of a woman and being needed to be cared for by those two parents. And even he had to flee for his life from the enemy, the King Herod, who wanted to kill him. It's the story, it's, it's gutty, it's, it's gritty, it's real. And that's the story of God. And it proved that Jesus was willing to be with us. In fact, much, much of Jesus' life isn't even recorded. So even in the boring, seemingly meaningless parts of life, the fact of the life of Jesus, when you study it, represents all of God's willingness to restore fellowship, relationship with humankind. And so let's look at Jesus' life, because Jesus' life becomes clear through the lens of fellowship. It begins first with this. His teaching showed us how to live with God. In other words, Jesus, when he taught us, he, it was life-giving, it was life-saving, it was encouraging, but at times... It was challenging. At times, it cost us. Why? Because that's what relationships cost. They always, any relationship that means anything, costs something of you 
in this regard. But Jesus in his teaching came to set the record straight. He came to erase the lines that religions had drawn and provide an open invitation to whoever wants to, to have a relationship with God when you recognize that you need him. See, Jesus removed all the barriers, all the other preconditions that mankind's thinking and religion taught. No, Jesus came. Even think about this, his very first message he taught back in his own hometown of Nazareth. And when he was handed the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he turned to the passage which said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to bring the good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, and hearing to the deaf, and the opening of the prison doors to those that are bound, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for a, for, for, for a spirit of heaviness and oppression. In other words, Jesus was pointing to in his teaching who God was for, who God came to be with, where society had kicked people to the marginal ends of it and felt like they didn't belong to God. God was showing, in fact, Jesus' most uh, famous of all sermons, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, it began with what he calls the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes were, began this way. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? Because they matter to God. Jesus' teachings showed us not only who God, how to live with God, but to trust that he was for us. Jesus came through his sermons and through his parables. He recognized one of his most famous parables, the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, showed that his mission was to restore fellowship with what was lost. God was not willing to allow that to remain. Jesus came on the mission to seek and save what was lost and to restore fellowship, to show that God was for us. In fact, I love this passage. In Matthew's gospel, he tells us that Jesus, and I believe it summarizes his teaching, but it's Matthew 11. And I took this out of the message because I love the way the message says this, but listen to this. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Let me ask you the question. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Religion means all of the things we need to do to get near God when we fail to realize that the message of the gospel was that all that God did to get near us. You see, Jesus said, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. He made it possible for us because he says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. And that's his still encouragement, come to him. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Look at this next verse. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. In other words, Jesus modeled life of what it meant to live with God, what to live in fellowship with God. He was there with us to encourage us. He says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that. I love the way that it says that the unforced rhythms of grace. Because a life with God is a life of understanding grace. He said, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I mean, what is it that people generally are turned off by, on, about by religion? It's a bunch of d rules, a bunch of do's and don'ts, a bunch of demands that we need to do. When Jesus says, listen, learn from me. I'll teach you the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't put anything heavy or burdensome on you. Because when Jesus had laid this charge to the religious leaders of his time. He said, you guys are hypocrites. You lay burdens on the people that you yourselves don't even lift a finger to do. And that's the part of religion that people are turned off to, the hypocrisy. When you expect of somebody else something that you yourself don't even accomplish or do. But none of that had to do with the message of Jesus. Because he went on to, he finished it and said this, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound fantastic? And that's the story of Jesus. In fact, let me summarize the teachings of Jesus because Jesus' teachings pointed to a new way of living. And so it's, it's a life together with God. Life as it was meant to be lived. In other words, Jesus' teaching pointed us that when grace and growth, they go together. When forgiveness flows freely and fully. When we live to serve and not be served. Where the poor and the oppressed are not ignored or overlooked, 
but rather protected and provided for. These are the things that Jesus' teachings pointed to. Where darkness of sin is dispelled by the light of God's love. And where a bridge is permanently built, giving us the ability to come home. That's what Jesus pointed to in his teachings. But secondly, listen, his miracles reveal that God is with and for the powerless and the faithful. See, Jesus' miracles pulls back the curtain and shows what happened when divinity meets humanity. Jesus' miracles weren't about what people were able to do. In fact, his miracles were done, it's so amazing when you read them, to people that had nothing. They were powerless. In fact, Jesus' first miracle was performed where? It was performed in a wedding feast in a town just, just outside of where he grew up, a town called Cana. And in fact, most of the guests, nobody even realized, only his disciples and his mom and the servants that followed what he told them to do knew that this miracle took place. Jesus, many times, where were his miracles performed? The people who were on the fringes of society, the blind, the poor, the, 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 the lepers, the lame, the ones that people felt didn't belong in the, in the mainstream of society. I think of the woman with the issue of blood. She came to Jesus because Jesus also said his miracles are released by simply this power of believing and trusting in who he is. In fact, Jesus said it this way. All that is required is faith the size of a mustard seed. If you have that, you can even say to a mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. See, Jesus proved this. Just like that woman with the issue of blood, when society said, no, you can't come in, she said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And when she was, Jesus turned and looked at her and said, woman, your faith has made you whole. See, he showed his power to the powerless, but yet the ones that would trust that he is, who he said he is, that he would come and do all that he promised he would do. You see, to those that simply believe, and that's the same for us today. And the third one is this, I love this. His disciples showed us that God, that God is willing to be friends with those who are willing to follow him. He's willing to be friends. In essence, his disciples, they were ones that were willing to hear the call of Jesus and follow him. That's what it means to be a friend of Jesus. Jesus, it's said sometimes about people that you can tell a lot about a person by the company that they keep. The disciples of Jesus weren't well-connected people. They weren't people apart, uh, you know, wealthy or, or, or uh, a part of the upper crust or the influential in society. No, they were just ordinary people like you and me. In fact, listen, the religious leaders, this was their commentary on Jesus' followers in the book of Acts. It says, these men were ignorant and unlearned. In other words, they're just normal, natural, ordinary, everyday people. But Jesus didn't just call them followers. He called them friends. Look at this. In John 15, it says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. In other words, when you read the Gospels, Jesus spent time with his disciples. And as, fr as a friend, he revealed to them. The, the crowds got the teaching, but they got the, the commentary. They were able to ask him questions. He was willing and ready to reveal to them, to show to them, to help them understand the things that he was teaching. He said, a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. Because friends share life together. Friends don't keep things from each other. He said, for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. And the question is this. Did they misunderstand him? Yes. Did they fail him at times? Yes. Did they abandon him in his greatest time of need? Yes. But Jesus never gave up on them. Jesus stayed committed to fellowship. He restored them. He turned them around. And when he turned them around, guess what? They turned the world upside down. And the good news for you and I is that the invitation to be a friend of Jesus is just as appropriate, just as real, just as valid today as it ever has been because he is a living Savior. 
you and I can have relationship with him. Because the disciples proved that you don't have to be connected. You don't have to be well-known. You don't have to be influential. You just have to be one willing to follow him. And when we are, he's willing to allow himself to be our friend. It's one that wants to spend time with us to get to know him. Because he knows that knowing him influences our life for the better. And that's what he's willing to do. And now get us this next part, which is so true. In his death, he proved that despite our inconsistency to remain faithful to him, he would never abandon us. Do you know that the most of the gospel texts deal with the last week of Jesus' life? And in fact, the very last few days, much of what was written by the apostles deal with that end of it. And it's in those times it began with the, 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 the Passover meal they held together, what we call traditionally the night of the Last Supper. Jesus washes their feet to show them the extent of his love for them, to leave them an example to follow after he leaves. He tells them he's going to leave, and he knows that they're, going to, they're troubled by that term. But he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to make a place for you. Because where I am, there will you be also. See, the story of Jesus is a story of God with us. But yet, he tells them that night, you guys are going to abandon me. You're all going to be scattered. Peter says, no way. I would never. And Jesus says, Peter, before this night even passes, you'll deny me three times. And even though that, that happened, even though Peter followed through, doing what Jesus said he would do, even though he claimed he would never do that, Jesus didn't abandon him. Jesus restored him to the place that he had called him to be. And I want you to know he's the same. He's never changed. And so Jesus took the disciples to the garden. Jesus was in great distress of soul. He wanted them to pray with him. But what did they do? They slept. And how many times have we had great intentions to do something for God and don't follow through? But the good news is this. Even though they weren't faithful to him, he remained faithful to them. He remained ready because he had come for this reason, to restore fellowship, which meant that not only was he coming to be with them, he was willing to give his life for them. So the relationship between God and man can be restored for good. So in that place, wasn't it a garden where the first betrayal took place? And it's so funny that a garden takes place when his own closest followers betray their loyalty to him and can't even stay with them one hour to pray. But yet Jesus is arrested and at his trial, instead of his friends being there, now his accusers are there. Nobody stands up for him. Nobody testifies for him. But he's doing it to remain faithful to us. And so Jesus is condemned to die. He's led to the cross. And at the cross, where are his disciples? They're hiding. They're hiding for fear of their own lives except for a small little group the women that had come from, with him from Galilee, and the Apostle John. They're the ones that remain at the cross, but yet his accusers are there. And all this, Jesus shows his willingness to be with us because he asks in that moment, he praises his Father, forgive them. The people crucifying, he said, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And then the thief, one of the thieves that were, that were crucified with him, turned to him and said, Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's, again, Jesus affirming the mission that he came for. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, the story of the Gospels is the story of God with us. A God who came to restore fellowship with us. Jesus' death, two friends that nobody even knew were followers of his. Joe and Nick. Joseph of Arimathea and, Nick, and Nicodemus put their own reputations, their own careers on the line. Although they were a part of the Sanhedrin, they didn't vote to execute Jesus. And Joseph makes a bold move and asks Pilate for the body of Jesus because he wanted his friend to have a dignified burial. And Nicodemus brought the spices and all that was necessary and they lay Jesus, and I love this, they lay him in a garden tomb. And why is that important? Why is that significant? Because wasn't it in a garden that sin came between man and God and brought death? Isn't it funny that it's in a garden that sin would be ultimately paid for and the barrier removed 
and life instead of death would come in the resurrection of Jesus. And so in essence, those women that had watched where Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea laid the body of Jesus, they brought the spices. And on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb to, to anoint Jesus' body. And what did they discover when they arrived? The stone was rolled away. Did you ever ask yourself the question, why was the stone rolled away? You know, I used to think it was rolled away so Jesus could get out. But no, when you read the Gospels, Jesus could go through a wall. But he came into a, a locked room to be with his disciples. No, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. Are you kidding me? Upon his resurrection, nothing could separate him. Nothing could stop him. Nothing stood in the way. No, the stone was rolled away so you and I could go in. Those women went in because they saw death was defeated. They went in to realize that now nothing was separated them and God. That now all the barriers, all the things that ever came between man and God, Jesus eliminated. Jesus took out of the way. That his death was satisfying for all the sin of mankind. And now we could have a relationship with God with no barriers and nothing coming between us and God. And that's why I love it. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way. He said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor any, anything else in all of creation will be able, listen to me, take this personally right now, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The resurrection is an invitation to enter into a relationship with God and see that death no longer holds any power to separate you and God. That nothing, there is nothing in heaven or in earth, there is nothing under the earth, there is nothing that stands in the way that now God who came to be with us provided through Jesus the ability to restore a relationship, fellowship with you and I. All of it's been eliminated. All of it's been put aside. Jesus' resurrection is good news because now whosoever can come, now whosoever can choose to restore relationship and know him in a personal fashion. So let me close with this idea is this. Ultimately, his invitation to follow him is how we experience a life of fellowship with God. Jesus' invitation to follow is just as relevant today. But what does it mean to follow? Follow means that you accept somebody for who they are and also what they did on your behalf. See, Jesus, recognizing who he is, when you have the courage to recognize that this was the extent that God was willing to go to, to be with us, that Jesus was God who became human so we could know him, that we could understand him, that no longer would there be doubt or uncertainty that if you want to know God just look at Jesus and to realize that he came to be with us he came to restore fellowship he came to to willingly limit his life and all that he went through on earth for the purpose of giving you and I the opportunity to know him and when you do to follow him means that you're willing to accept him for who he is. You're, allow, you're willing to allow his teachings to guide you to know how to live with him. You're willing to recognize the beauty of what we've been invited into. To know and understand that the God who made us came to restore a relationship with him that we can experience when we choose of our own free will to follow him. To allow a relationship with him to be formed where we become his friend, that he becomes a priority in our life, that we live our lives for him because of what he did for us. To know that he loves us and have no question or doubt of that so that we trust him to follow him always, even when it doesn't seem to make sense. The story of the Gospels is the story of God with us. It's a story of all that God was willing to go through to make fellowship with him possible for every single human being. All of the gutty, raw reality of what God did on our behalf, what God took upon himself in personal to make possible for every human. You see, salvation doesn't rest on what we do. It rests on what God did for us, what Jesus did. And that's why when we accept Jesus as the Lord, 
and the Savior of our lives. That's the beginning of following him, is to realize that he's God, that I trust you. I believe in you. I love you because you first loved me. That's what this represents. So I want you to ask yourself the question this morning, where are you? What is it that's gotten in the way between you and God? But maybe the good news today is the realization that now the only thing that can stand between you and God is you. Because the door is open. The way has been made. As the teachings of Jesus so, so clearly described to us that Jesus' life became the bridge which once separated us from God, our sins. Jesus laid down his life paid for our sins in full and made it possible for all of us through him to be reconnected, restored in relationship with God. Today, maybe the decision to move forward is to recognize that Jesus wants to be your friend. He wants to be one that you want to be with because he's already shown us and proven to us that he's willing to go to great extent to be with us.